Father, we thank you for this day and the many blessings you've given us, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to be in your house today. Lord, I pray that you with these uh, many prayer requests that were mentioned, Lord. Many are uh, going to be going into surgery, Lord. Um, uh, many dealing with cancer issues, Lord. I just pray that you'll be with the doctors, give them wisdom. But Lord, ultimately, I pray that you'll put your healing hand on these uh, people that are dealing with these situations. Lord, I pray that you'll be with the money that will be collected, Lord. Help us to use it. Uh, to uh, do the things that you'd have us to do and also pray that you'll be with the service. Bless it in your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing How Marvelous Our Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Coming after. 
to me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. sing it as well with my soul when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows what The ship of your life is tossing on the sea of strife. You need someone. If you feel so all alone and your house, it's not a home, you need someone. If it seems life isn't fair And there's no one left to share All those lonely days and nights When things just won't turn out right And you want someone to care Oh, someone to just be there You need someone So I give you Jesus He's the perfect love that casteth out of fear. I give you Jesus. He's the water that you'll drink and never thirst again. I give you Jesus, my friend. I give you Jesus. If the pressure all around just keeps your spirits to the ground, you need someone. If your body is in pain and your health you can't regain, you need someone 
If there are times that you have tried with all the strength you had inside, but it seems that you have failed, remember on his cross he nailed all your bitterness and grief to give you peace and sweet relief. For he is that someone that you need. So I give you Jesus. He's the peace that passes all understanding. I give you Jesus. He's the perfect love that casteth out. Instead of gently handing me over, he took me and threw me across the room to the cops. That's what began my fatherless journey. About a month later, my dad packed up his things and moved back to his hometown of Las Vegas, Nevada, and never returned again. At that point, my sister, my brother, and I, we became fatherless. My mother became a single mom. And eventually, my grandparents helped raise me. There are millions of us that are fatherless in the United States. And it's causing us to often feel inferior, insecure, have a lack of worth. And because of that, it's become our number one social issue in our country. Because without that worth, without that security, without the confidence that you get from a dad, oftentimes fatherless individuals are going into crime, they're dropping out of school, committing suicide, getting involved in all kinds of cultural problems. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says that fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness, suicide, poor educational performance, teen pregnancy, and criminality. Fatherless families are all around us. Maybe it's a coworker, somebody in your neighborhood. Maybe it's in your own family where you have a niece or a nephew. Or maybe you know of a grandparent that's raising their grandkids. Or maybe it's your own grandkids and they're struggling with this issue. This is where my story changed. When my dad left, my grandparents picked up the pieces. I eventually moved in with them when I was in second grade. My grandfather became like a dad to me. But when I was in sixth grade, my grandfather passed away. His death left me fatherless once again. Then I had a youth pastor that came when I was in seventh grade and he filled that gap. And I had youth leaders that, that stepped in and they, they encouraged me and helped me through my middle school years and even into high school. Then I had a guy named Jim, Jim and Deb. And they started working with me when I was 15 years old. And even to this day, they're like my second family. Jim's like a dad to me. Deb's like a second mom to me. Even my kids call them Gramps and Grammy Deb. Jim's even on our board for our ministry. There's no blood relation, there's no marriage relation. It's just a guy that took time to show a fatherless kid God's love and show him that he cared about him. Jim did that for me and he helped me and encouraged me. But I know I was a rarity. Sadly, there's millions of kids that don't get to have what I had. They don't get to have that mentor, that person in their life that shows them love, that shows them God's love. I was blessed to have these individuals. My journey now is to help these kids 
to help the fatherless children, the fatherless teens, the fatherless young adults, the single moms, the grandparents raising their grandkids know that God loves them and to bring Christians into their lives to help them and encourage them along the way. I wanna ask you, will you be involved in a fatherless family's life? Will you help them? Will you do something for them? They need you. And as Christians, we can all do something for the fatherless around us. Fatherlessness is often such a hopeless issue, but through the Lord Jesus Christ, these children and teenagers and single moms and grandparents raising their grandkids can get set free. But God wants you to go to them and help them through this. We can all make a difference in their lives. Are you willing to make a difference today by praying for fatherless families that are around you? By praying for us as we minister to fatherless families? By having a presence in their lives and by sharing our gospel-centered resources with them? By bringing us in to speak at your next event or at your church? And by financially supporting our ministry as we go and share God the Father's love to them? Sean, you come this way. We're excited to have Sean Tice with us this morning, founder of Life Factors Ministry, a ministry to the fatherless in the United States, and a very unique ministry. The Bible has much to say about how God feels about the fatherless, how he loves them and cares for them. And so we're excited to have Sean today present his work this morning. Welcome, Sean Tice. Good morning. Great to be here this morning. We had a great time in Sunday school and looking forward to be able to share with you about our ministry this morning. Luke chapter 10, if you want to turn there, Luke chapter 10 is where we'll be based out of this morning. Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bible, if you have your, your phone, whatever you want to do, turn to Luke chapter 10. You know, our ministry, we, uh, well, just to tell you real quick, I usually introduce my family. My, my wife and my middle son and my daughter are not with us this morning. My younger son was not feeling well this morning, so they had to stay. We actually travel around the country in an RV, and so, again, I said in Sunday school, the people tell me, that's my dream. That's my dream. I take that all the time. I'm like, it's not my dream. You know what I mean? I mean I'm just saying, like, it's something that I, uh, you know, we do it, and we're thank, we're so thankful for that RV. We really are. I'm not trying to belittle what God did. God, God blessed us with that, and uh, it's been a blessing to have. It really is, and we've been able to live in that. And having your own bed everywhere you go, pretty much, is amazing, okay? And also the security for our kids. And it's just, it really is a, it's a blessing. Um, but they're back at the, where we're staying in an RV park in Batesville, Indiana. We have this uh, thing called Thousand Trails, and it helps us be able to stay in places for longer. And it's a great, great membership thing. But anyways, they're there, so just pray for my son. They'll probably be with us tonight. I don't think it's anything contagious or anything. He just wasn't feeling well. And so pray for them. But usually we have my my youngest daughter. She's a little fiery redhead named Blair. She's a little four-year-old, and I had two boys before her, and I thought I had all this parenting stuff figured out, and then I had her, and so she's, uh, she's definitely a blessing for us, and then I have my, my oldest son with me, Malachi. He's back there. Um, raise your hand, Malachi. Malachi's back there. He's my little helper, so if you need any help with our table or anything, go see him. He's, he's a great, great uh, help for me, but what we do is we, we uh, travel around. We're, we're on what we call the Hope for Fatherless America National Tour. We'll be on over 80 churches this year and speaking in conferences, colleges, seminaries, wherever the Lord leads. And we, we go around, we, we uh, spread awareness, we go into these events and talk about the issue of fatherlessness, educating what's happening in our country, and I'll show you some statistics here in a few moments and showing you what's, what's going on with this issue of fatherlessness. But then also we go and speak, too. We go into public schools, Christian schools. Uh, we go into prisons, youth detention centers, wherever the Lord leads. Wherever the, the doors are opened up, we go in and we speak messages of hope and uh, encouraging people to, to, uh, to follow Jesus with their life. Um, thankfully, and all through God, we've seen over 50, about, about 50 people get saved this year uh, through the different events and stuff we've been to. Uh, we had... We went to one single mom conference. Had 16 single moms trust in Jesus as their savior at the one. Nine single moms at the other one. You're like, what? Do you, how are you speaking to single moms? Well, I go, and that's kind of awkward for me going to a single mom conference. Um, it's kind of like, okay, this is a little intimidating. But I go in the perspective of having a single mom growing up, and I go and speak to them from what I saw as a fatherless child, and it was really, really 
really powerful, and I was thankful that it was because I was a little nervous going there, and, but I'm thankful that I was able to, to do that. We did one of those in Texas and also in Florida, um, but God's really just been opening doors for us. He's been blessing us. We also have unique resources. Uh, we have devotionals for fatherless teen guys, for fatherless teen girls, for single moms. Those books are on the back table. They can be used as a small group study, a one-on-one mentoring resource, or just a personal study. They have questions, and they work through the top 30 things that you would deal with in the situation. We've had ages from 10 years old up to uh, senior adults read those books and use those books to help them with the, with the issues that they're dealing with. We also have children's books for fatherless children, for motherless children, and for orphan and foster care children. They're just the beginning in a whole series of books that we have called After the Ark, and that, that series is to help uh, fatherless individuals, motherless individuals, and also orphan and foster care kids understand that it's not their fault and that God loves them and he'll fill the gap for them. We also have a God is My Dad mobile app that you can download from the Apple or Google Play Store. You just search God is My Dad in there. On there we have videos from Christian leaders such as the Skit Guys, um, such as, uh, did you guys ever hear the movies Courageous, War Room? Those movies we have the producer of, from there, Stephen Kendrick's on there. We have different pastors, ministry leaders that have made videos for us to help the fatherless saying, hey, you can make it. You can overcome Um, going through what you're going through, and God will help you through it. We also have a place on there where you can share your story. So if you've been fatherless, if you grew up like that and God helped you through it, you can share your story on there. It's an anonymous thing. It's just your first name and your state, and you can share your story of how God brought you through, and that helps the other fatherless individuals. We just had a single mom recently comment on our Facebook page and say, I am, my son loves to hear how you know, other, how others have made it through, and then these stories help him and encourage him, and she shared a picture of him, a little, little five- or seven-year-old boy riding on a swing, and it was just really encouraging to see that. We also have on there how-to articles, how-to videos, and we're going to have a ton of other content and different resources coming soon on there, this, how God's leading us and, and guiding us for that. I want to encourage you, get your smartphones out real quick, or just your regular phone. You don't have a smartphone. If you have a phone, get your phone out real quick. I want to, I want to get you guys uh, plugged into our ministry. If you just text the word DAD to 66866. So if you want to stay with us and go on this journey with us and get emails from us, you can sign up on the clipboard, the old school way, in the back table, or you can go and text this. this is the new thing we're doing. Text 66866 is the number you text to, and text the word DAD to it. That'll opt you into our email list, and you'll get a free devotional, a God is My Dad devotional uh, this week, and then you'll also get some videos and all kinds of content to help you if you want to reach the FOD list or if you want to get through this yourself. We'll send you some different resources there. But text, the, text to, to the number 66866, text the word DAD to it, and that'll opt you into our email list. But I just want to tell you about our ministry a little bit this morning. We also partner with local churches. We have online training. We have resources for local churches. As, so when we, when we uh, raise support, we are, we are raising support right now. When we partner with the local church, we give back and we give resources to that church to help them minister to the fatherless. And so we send a whole kit. We have a whole online training site. And so really those are the four things we do. We spread awareness. We create unique resources. We speak and then we also partner with local churches. This morning I want to talk to you about this issue of fatherlessness. Before I do, I want to encourage you, don't shut me out, okay? Maybe you think this issue doesn't affect you. Maybe it's not something that's personal to you. But this issue, I guarantee you, is affecting you one way or another. And I'm going to show you through the statistics and also through the scriptures of, about this issue biblically, but also through what's going on in our country. If you're a patriotic person and you love the United States of America, you will do something about this issue of fatherlessness. It's the number one social issue in our country. There's over 30 million fatherless kids in the United States of America. And they're struggling oftentimes. They're dealing with different things that maybe you don't understand, but they're, 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 they're struggling through it. And we need Christians to step up and do something about this issue. Look at it with me in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 29. It says, But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And this is often, and you're going to see through the statistics, this is very like the fatherless in our country. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Two very sad verses. And sadly, this is very like how we as a church body in the cross of the United States of America have handled this situation of fatherlessness. But I want to encourage you, I'm here to encourage you to be like 33, where it says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him. 
and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him, that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go. And do that likewise. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into this message. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for just allowing us to be able to come here this morning. I thank you for Pastor Keller and his willingness to, to bring us here this morning. I pray that you'd bless this service now. Speak through me, rid me of myself, speak through me now, and help us to think about the individuals in our lives that might be hurting or struggling or dealing with something in their life that we could help with. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to give you three things you can do to reach the fatherless in your circle of influence, or if it's not the fatherless, if the Holy Spirit leads you differently, three things you can do to reach the the hurting people around you, the people that are around you. So this is for all of us, okay? And and God may direct you to that fatherless kid, that fatherless teen. We've, we've, We've come across fatherless senior adults that are still working through the issues that their dad has left in their life. So it could be an individual up in their years that you work with, okay? It could be a single mom, a grandparent raising grandkids, a foster family that you're helping. But I want to give you three things that you can do to help these hurting fatherless individuals. These are the ones I'm focusing on. Or if the Holy Spirit leads somebody else that he leads you to. The first thing is you've got to reject apathy. Reject apathy. You know, this we, we already read in these verses, but we see a lot of apathy happening in verses 31 and 32. When I was in, in, in uh, eighth grade, my teacher came to me, he said, Sean, he said, you have been apathetic. And I was one of those kids that was always getting in trouble, okay? Anybody else like that in here when you were in school? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest with me. They were getting in trouble all the time, okay? I was one of those kids that they're just struggling through school, okay? And so this teacher's like, you, you've been apathetic. And I looked at him, I said, I don't even know what that means. Never heard that word in my life, okay? Never heard that word before. And he said, that means that, means that you don't care. And you don't care that you don't care. And I said, you are correct. I did not care. He was right. He was talking about eighth grade science, and I didn't care. I still don't. I didn't care then either, okay? If you're in eighth grade, you should care. Care about that class, okay? But I didn't care. Don't follow my example. I floated through school, okay? But I'm just saying, in eighth grade, I didn't care about science. But I learned that day what apathy meant, what it meant to be apathetic. You know, and it's not a good trait. It really isn't. Being apathetic is not something that, that uh, God wants us to have in our lives. And I've looked at my life over the years, and I've seen how I've been apathetic. And we see in verses 31, verse 31 says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He was apathetic. He's like, no, nah, I don't have time for that. Then we see the Levite. It says in, in verse uh, 32, And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, and look what else he did. It says he came and looked on him. He didn't just walk by him and see him. He just he went and looked. Well, that guy looks like he's struggling. That's too bad. Kicked him, maybe. I don't know what he did, but he, he's like, hey, you okay? You okay? And he, he wasn't sure what to do. He just walked by. And he was apathetic, okay? The priest and the Levite were apathetic. But then 33 tells us the Samaritan was, he, he said no. He said, no, I'm not going to be an apathetic person. And this is the example for us as Christians how we're supposed to handle the people in our circle of influence. You know, I reference this circle of influence that we have. Every single one of us has a circle of influence. We have people in our circle. We have a whole circle around us. We have coworkers. We have a neighborhood that we live in. We have a community we live in. We have family. Maybe you have a niece or a nephew. You have cousins. You have an extended family maybe that you know of. Maybe you have people, whoever it is, people in your church, that is in your circle of influence, this place there that maybe your pastor will never meet, maybe the leadership of this church will never meet, maybe other Christians in here will never meet, but you've met them. And God specifically, and he placed them around you specifically for a reason. He, he wants them helped and encouraged, and he's put them in your, in your circle of influence. And he wants you to encourage them. He strategically put them there. And I want you to think about those people now. Who are they? Who's in your circle that maybe you've been apathetic about? I want to encourage you to reject that apathy. And say, okay, I'm not going to be apathetic anymore. Because we all can think of people in our circle where we're like, I don't really have time for that. That's messy. I don't have margin for that in my life. You know, we do, there's this whole business movement with, you know, you need to have margin in your life or being a, you know, a minimalist, which, we, you know, you should have some of that stuff. You need to make margin for your family and stuff like that. But you should always focus on reaching the fatherless the people that are around you because God cares about the fatherless. He really does. 
He loves them. He wants them helped. He wants them to be, be encouraged. He wants, he wants us as Christians to, to guide them. But sadly, oftentimes, we as Christians, we just walk past them. You know, I'm passionate about this issue of fatherlessness because I grew up without a dad. But I was blessed to have, as you saw in the video, all these people that came into my life to help me. It was still a struggle. I'm not going to lie to you. It really was. It was still hard. It, wasn't, it was not easy. But I see all these others out there all these friends and people I've seen going before me and, and people I've worked with, how they have not had the people that I had. And I imagine, and I think to myself, what if they would have? What if they would have? What if they would have somebody that said, I'm going to reject apathy? Even my own dad, my own dad, he was, he was 13 years old, his dad died. It was him and, and then he had a little brother named David Tice, and his little brother was 10. His little brother got plugged into the local church. He eventually got, got a, a mentor through the church through his youth pastor. My dad never got plugged into the church. He never, got to have, he never had that experience. He rejected it. But I wonder if somebody as a Christian would have come alongside him and really tried to work with him and truly tried to help him in the position he'd be in today, where he would be. You know, I went and saw him in January while I was out in Las Vegas, and he He's, a, he's a, been a drug addict, an alcoholic, and he's just a heavily addicted man. He's, he's so sick now, he can barely get out of bed. and He's only in his 60s. He looks horrible. I couldn't help but feel bad for this guy, and I wonder to myself, and then I look at my Uncle David. My Uncle David has this family. He's a pastor in Las Vegas, and he, he has five kids. He's got grandkids. He's, he's got this huge family. They send a picture out at Christmas time with all his family. And, and they, they see all, these, all this blessings that God's put on his life and because somebody was willing to invest in him as a fatherless teenager, a fatherless kid. And I wonder what would have happened with my dad and what would happen with the people around you if you would invest in them and help them and encourage them. I'm going to share some statistics with you now. And before I do, understand if you are a fatherless individual, if you are a single mom, if you are a grandparent raising grandkids, our ministry is about hope. Understand that you can make it through this through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can make it through this situation. Your kids can make it through this situation. Understand that these are just statistics. This is what's happening when people don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and when they're not walking with him. Statistics such as, you know, I shared one in the video, but there's a lot of other, other ones out there. We're not even going to be able to cover all of them today because there's so many. The crime. 85% of youth in prisons grew up in fatherless homes. I was at a youth detention center in Augusta, Georgia in March speaking at it, and 95% of the youth in that detention center came from fatherless homes. Why? Because they're either angry, they're either angry and because they don't know how to process that anger, they don't know how to handle those feelings of aggression that they have as a young man, or because they have looked for a family through a gang, tried to find that mentor in a gang, and they find that guy that says, yeah, I'll be your mentor. Go do this for me, and I'll, I'll provide this for you. And I'll help you out. And they get in these gangs. And majority, large majority of those guys in the one in Augusta came from a gang. They had the gang life. And they provided a family atmosphere for them. They had that father figure atmosphere until they realized, well, I don't want to be in this. And that's why they, they end up there. And I'm not giving them excuses, but oftentimes it's, you know, it's just by poor choices that they've made. But also they don't know how to process their anger. They don't know how to find a family. Imagine if they would have had a godly mentor come into their life to help them and steer them in the right direction. What we're looking for here is more people that care about the fatherless. 80% of rapists motivated with anger issues come from fatherless homes. Of the 27 deadliest mass shooters, 26 of them were fatherless. Get that number. 26 of the deadliest mass shooters were fatherless out of 27. This is affecting us. This affects us emotionally. This affects our tax dollars with the you know, youth detention centers and the prisons. This is affecting you in one way or another. It really is. It's hurting your communities with crime and stuff that's happening. And, and also issues such as homosexuality. There's a guy in California. His name is Dr. Joseph Nicolasi. And he, his job is to help homosexuals become heterosexual again. They go to him and say, I don't want to have these feelings. I don't, want to, I don't want to feel this way. And they go to him, the ones that have those feelings, they go to him. So it's not him trying to be you know, against homosexuals. He, just, he wants to help them. And they come to him and he said, I've worked with thousands of homosexuals. I've never seen one who had a loving, respectful relationship with their father. We see issues such as teen pregnancy. 
you know, teen pregnancy and abortion, we see a white teenage girl from an advantaged background is five times more likely to become a teen mother if she lives, lives in a single mother household than if she lives in a household with both biological parents. And oftentimes that either results in abortion or results in her keeping the baby and then the grandparents have to help raise the grandkid and they're thankful that, that she kept the baby. They really are, but it's still, they're struggling through that process. And there's a high divorce right now amongst grandparents raising grandkids because the grandfathers are saying, I've already done my time as a parent. So again, these are affecting your community, these are affecting your families, they're affecting people around you. You probably can think of people that, this is, that people are dealing with these different issues. That young lady, she went after that boy because she's lacking security. She's lacking security. She's looking for a dad to tell her she's worth something, that he loves her and cares about her. Instead, she has to find that teenage boy that says, I'll, bring, I'll bring, provide security to you. It's not what she needs. And that's why it, this often happens. And we, where we get angry about it. We're like, why is there so much abortion? Why is there so much homosexuality? Why is this country, why are these people shooting each other? What's going on? If we would just go and reach one fatherless kid, one fatherless kid, we can do something about these issues. I'm not giving these people excuses. I'm really not. But if they don't have Christians to come into their life to help them and guide them, how are they ever going to know anything different than sin? You know, issues such as suicide, three out of four. Get this number, three out of four teenage suicides occur in a household where a parent has been absent. Three out of four. And then the last one I'll share with you is actually education too. In studies involving over 25,000 children using nationally representative data sets, children who lived with only one parent had lower grade point averages, lower college aspirations, poor attendance records, and higher dropout rates than students who live with both parents, often resulting in dropping out of high school, like it says, or they, they rely on the government because then they don't end up getting a good job, and then so we, they struggle through these things. And we see this happening in our neighborhoods and our communities all around us, and we're like, what's going on? Fatherlessness is, is going on. That's what's happening. And the, 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 number, the uh, statistic I shared in the video, it talked about fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness, suicide, poor education performance, teen pregnancy, and criminality. Notice it says mental illness in there. Mental illness is a big issue today. And then sometimes you need medication. Sometimes there's a chemical imbalance. Sometimes it is a physical issue that you're dealing with. Sometimes a kid just needs some love. They need a loving mentor to come into their life instead of popping them some pills, show them some love. And again, we as Christians can do that. This is not about you reaching the 30 million. This is about you reaching one. It's about you reaching one and helping and, and, and encouraging the, the fatherless. You know, there is hope. The hope is the local church. The hope is through us, through the Lord Jesus Christ. God uses our lives, and we can help them and connect them to the local church. We can work with them and invite them into our lives, invite them into our families and encourage them. But you have to decide, I'm not going to be apathetic about this issue. Number two, in the... Uh, the uh, three things, the three steps you can do, the three things you can do to reach the, the, the fatherless around you or the hurting people around you is remit compassion. Remit compassion. Verse 33b says, and he had compassion on him. He had compassion on him. The ultimate picture of compassion is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? How he died on the cross for us and rose again and he, he loved us so much. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He loved you and I so much that he had joy in front of him saying, I want to be able to see them go to heaven when they die. I want them to have a chance to have hope on this earth. I want the fatherless to have a heavenly father that they can cling to on this earth. For the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? Could be those things, other things that he had. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? heard that verse. We've all heard John 3.16. And John 3.16 is talking about God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son so that he could have many sons and daughters. He wants a big family. God wants a big family. But how is this world going to hear if we don't go and tell? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, Sean, I've never been saved before. I've never trusted in Jesus as my Savior. I've never, never had a relationship with Jesus. You've got to first realize you're a sinner. Realize you've sinned before. Have you committed a sin? Have you done something wrong? Have you lied? You've stolen? You've cheated? You've done something wrong? That means you've sinned. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That means it's an eternity in hell that you've sinned before and your sin leads you to hell. 
But the Bible also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commendeth his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Understanding that your sin's going to lead you to hell, but through Jesus, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, and you can have a, you have a personal relationship with your heavenly Father, and you get to go to heaven when you die. So understanding that your sin leads you to hell, believing that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and putting your faith and trust in Jesus. If you've never made that decision before, I want to encourage you to make that decision. I had a youth leader one time say to me, I, he, was, he was at a church, I was volunteering as a youth director in Pennsylvania several years ago, and I asked, he was already there, we were just trying to kind of coming in to help with the youth group, and he said, I asked him a serious testimony with the youth group, and he said, I, I just have always gone to church. That's not how you're saved. This building can't save you from anything. Maybe a storm, I don't know, but it can't save you from hell, okay? It can't save you from hell. Just by going to church and by wearing you know, a tie and a suit and a, a, a nice dress or whatever, and dressing up and, and carrying your Bible with you, that doesn't save you. What saves you is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It says in the Bible, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never called upon Jesus to save you, what are you waiting for? Make that decision this morning. Now, if you have trusted in Jesus as your Savior, how's it going? Are you letting that compassion flow through you? Because you, you accepted the compassion that God had. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We accepted that gift of love and compassion from God, right? And we're supposed to let that compassion flow through us and go out to other people in the world. But oftentimes we put a cap on it and we say, good, I don't have to go to hell when I die. Who in here, likes to, who in here has ever heard of Spider-Man before? Who's heard of Spider-Man? Raise your hand. Like this guy's talking about Spider-Man? Yes, I am. Talking, who's, who's ever heard of Spider-Man? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest with me. Let's wake up a little bit. Spider-Man. Okay, Spider-Man, he got bit by what? A spider. Spider-Man got bit by a spider, and then he was able to shoot what? Webs. So Spider-Man got bit by a spider, he was able to shoot webs. Now picture this. Spider-Man goes home. He sits in his living room. He sits down. He's like, this is awesome. And he, what do you call it here? Pop or soda? I'm in the north, and I've had this thing where everybody's, I, I called it pop growing up, then I moved to Florida for 12, 12 and a half years, and everybody calls it soda, they're like, what's pop? And so I'm kind of confused, so we call it pop here, okay? So Spider-Man is in the north, and he's like, I want to pop. And so he shoots a web into his kitchen, and pulls open the fridge, shoots another web, and gets a pop, okay? Pulls the pop to him, he sits there, he's drinking his pop, he's like, this is great. I can watch a movie. I don't have to stand up anymore. You know, this is awesome. I love it. And so he's out there, and then he's like, you know what, I want to go out and play some basketball. And he goes out to his, his basketball court in the backyard, and, and he's like, I've never been able to dunk the ball before. And he shoots a web up, pulls himself up to the backboard, dunks the ball, yes! What a horrible Spider-Man movie that would be. You know what I'm saying? I mean, honestly, that would be terrible, because Spider-Man's supposed to be fighting crime, right? He's supposed to be out saving people and helping people, but instead he's using it for his own selfish wants and needs. And that's just like us as Christians. Where when, we, when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us the opportunity to trust in him. He rose again, gave us the opportunity to trust in him as our savior, right? And then we get to accept all this, these gifts from God, not just, not just heaven. We get all these, these gifts from God, all these promises from God that are put on upon our life, and we say, good, I don't have to go to hell when I die. That's awesome. Instead, we get to help people have hope on this earth. We get to help people, other people, go to heaven when they die. We have this power upon us. It's through God. It's not through you, but it's through God. And we get to show compassion to other people and guide other people to have hope in Jesus. Now, again, let me ask you, let me ask you this. What's it going like as a Christian? How's your life? Are you walking with God? You know, these, this, this issue of fatherlessness is in the Bible. You know, with, with the Bible, the, God cares about the fatherless. He really does. I mean, if you're still thinking, well, why should I care about the fatherless? Because God cares about them. Exodus 22, 22 says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Job 29, 12 says, Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, he delivered the fatherless. Okay? Psalm 68, 5, the whole thing with our God is my dad uh, brand out there. We have shirts and everything out there that you can, you can get. And, and we, we wear these shirts all over the place. And people love them. They relate to them. Okay, because they're, they're like, I get all the time, I love your shirt, I love your shirt, I love your shirt, because people are like, wow, or I see people staring at me when they're trying not to stare at you, you ever have that, where they're like, what does that guy's shirt say, and so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, but people love the fact that God is their father, because so many people are going through life not having that dad in their life, or they had a horrible dad, is what we come across, either they had a horrible dad, not a good dad, or they didn't have a dad, and so they relate to this issue, and so they're struggling through it, Psalm 68.5 says, a father of the fatherless, 
and a judge of the widows is God and his holy habitation. Psalm 146.9 says, The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless. But how is he going to relieve the fatherless if we don't bring them to him? He's called us to go and tell them about him. We're called to. I want to encourage you to go and, and tell the fatherless about the people around you, about, or about, about God. James 1.27 says, and maybe you heard this verse before, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and widows and their affliction and keep themselves spotted from the world. Who's heard that verse before? Now understand this. It's saying there it's a pure religious practice. That's way more important than any man-made tradition we've ever made up in our Christian culture. Okay? We've made up some man-made traditions. Some of them you might like, some of them you don't. I'm not going to get into a bait about that. That's not, my, that's not why I'm here this morning, okay? And you can decide which ones you like, whatever. That's man-made stuff. I'm talking about a pure religious practice. It's pure religion. Okay, that's stuff we should pay attention to as Christians. That's something I really need to, to listen to. It's okay, what is a pure religious practice? It says in this verse, and this is the entire answer to this entire problem in our country, okay? It's a pure religious practice for you as a Christian to go and visit, the, not just for your pastor, for you as a Christian to go and visit the fatherless. Visit means to look upon in order to help or to benefit, okay? This is not a one-time thing. This is you inviting them into your life, you, and, you, and, you trying to go into their life and working with them and going, going with them and helping them. Maybe once a week, once a month, every other week, whatever you can do, Okay? Going into their life, it says to the fatherless. That's, that, I mean, if you look at the root translation of the fatherless, that's talking about someone who has lost a father or mother or both. Okay? And then it also says, and widows. And we as a church body as across the United States of America, we oftentimes do a great job of reaching the widows, and we should. But if you look at the root of that word, widows can, can mean either someone that's lost a husband due to death or abandonment. What about the single moms? Abandonment. Because many times these dads have walked away. My mom oftentimes felt like a black sheep in our church when we were growing up. We had a great church. They really did take care of us. But sometimes she felt like a black sheep because she used to say, I wish my husband would have died because I would have been treated better. He basically was dead. He lived across the country in Las Vegas, never came back, never had anything to do with us. But because he was still physically living on this planet, she was considered a single mom and not a widow. And she was looked at. She was kind of labeled with a scarlet letter. Like, oh, you're one of them. Don't treat them like that. Love the single moms around you. Encourage them. Encourage those grandparents that are raising grandkids and doing their best. Don't look at them like their kids are little brats. Look at them like, man, they need some help. I'm going to encourage them to help them. I was a little brat. I was a little brat. I'll tell you what. I was the kid crawling underneath the pews in the back, okay? I was the kid my mom was walking out of the door, taking me into the bathroom. Somebody set a chair in that bathroom so moms could spank their kids, okay? And my mom would take me in the bathroom and beat the snot out of me in, at church. That's child abuse, okay? I'm just going to say that. It was horrible. But I'm saying these single moms are doing their best. I'm thankful we had a church that cared about us, and they, we really did. We had a church that loved us, but there were still people that looked at us like we were kind of labeled. Don't look at them like that. Look at them with love and have pure religion in your heart. The last thing is, as we kind of wrap this up, so you've got to reject apathy. You, got, you have to remit compassion. Let compassion flow through you and say, okay, I'm going to be compassionate. But I'm not traveling around the country in an RV for you to say, oh, those poor little kids. It's kind of like that dog commercial. Did you ever see that dog commercial on TV where Jackie Velasquez is singing, in the eyes of an angel. You ever see that? You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, if these little dogs are like sick and they're dying and they're crying and you're like, I don't want to look at that. I'll turn the channel real fast. Where's the remote? Turn it. Okay, that, I, that's the way I am. Who, who turns the channel? Who's ever seen that commercial? Come on, be honest with me. And it's, it's sad. And that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about little dogs, okay? Dogs are fine, whatever. I'm talking about human beings. And we, our job is to care about them. And I don't want you to just walk out today and say, oh, this little poor little kid, did you hear about all that? Oh, that's too bad. Committing suicide and having teen pregnancies and going to jail. Man. And sadly, that's often the result we have with this issue of fatherlessness. I'm here for you to react with a plan. That's the third thing. React with a plan. Do something. Who's ever seen a movie before where it just ends? where you're just like watching it, the guy is in a coma, or in, and you're like, is he going to come out? And then it just ends. Or he, they're, they're in war, or something about to happen, and the movie just ends. Or they're falling in love, and they're, they're going to get married, 
and the movie just ends. Who's ever seen a movie like that? Who hates movies like that? Raise your hand. I hate movies like that. They drive me nuts because for the next 10 minutes, you watch the credits, they roll, and you're thinking there's going to be an extra scene, right? Right? You watch it. You see that. And then you wait for it, and then it never does. Never, no extra scene. Then you wait for it to come on, on television. You wait five years. It comes on television, whatever. You see it on TV, and every time it plays, you think there's going to be a different ending. It's the same ending every time, okay? You make up endings in your head. Okay, you're struggling. You're like, I wish this would have ended differently. That stupid director or producer, whoever made this movie was an idiot. It should have ended like this. It's just the movie people. Calm down, okay? Calm down. It's the complete opposite from every Hallmark movie ever made, okay? Every Hallmark movie ever made is predictable. A guy or a girl goes to a small town, right? They got that big city boyfriend or girlfriend attorney that they used to love, but then they go to this town and they have a flat tire or something. They get that cowboy or cowgirl that comes, helps them, okay? And all of a sudden, they're like, they think they're a jerk at first, but then they realize, I love that cowboy or cowgirl. And they have a job. They got to save a factory or a cafe, right? Or the inn. They have to save something. And at the end of the movie, they reject it. They need to dump that boyfriend or girlfriend in the city, fall in love, and they save that cafe or factory, right? You with me? That's a Hallmark movie. They're all the same. They drive me nuts. I hate them. I hate them, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. My wife loves them. If you love Hallmark movies, that's fine. My wife loves them too. She does. But we do know they're all the same, okay? Let's just be honest. All the same actors and actresses. I don't know how many times these people can get married to each other in different settings. I don't understand it. It's really crazy. Who likes Hallmark movies in here? Raise your hand. It's okay. I'm not talking about those movies. I'm talking about the ones that are unpredictable because they just, they just end. And you're like, what happened? And I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that this passage didn't just end with verse 33 where it says, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Imagine if it just ended there. Oh, he felt bad for him. That's, man, that's too bad. And that's what we do as Christians. Oftentimes we stop at the compassion part. We say, oh, and it's like one of those movies that we don't like. Where instead, we could have kept going with that compassion. God put that compassion in our hearts and made us, made us feel something. Roll with it. Go with it. Do something with it. And look what he did, and here's a plan that we have. The first step to it is in verse 34, and went to him. That's the first step, you stepping out and saying, I'm going to do something. Texting that person that you're thinking of, Facebook messaging them, calling them, writing them an email, send them a letter in the mail, Give, send them a wire. I don't care what you do. Reach out to them in some way or just start praying for them. Start praying for ways to do something about this issue. React with a plan. They say if you don't do something in the next 48 hours, you most likely won't. I want to encourage you between now and Tuesday, make sure you do something about the people God's bringing into your heart, okay? God's bringing into your mind. Do something about it. So he went to him. Look what he did. Here's, here's, this is a guidance on what you can do. And bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And set him on his own beast. He used his own resources to help him heal. He even used his own vehicle, okay, to take him where he needed to go. And brought him to an inn. He gave him lodging and took care of him. Helped him out when he was struggling. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. He even used his own resources to take care of him when he was going to be gone. Now understand this. It doesn't have to be an extravagant plan. Doesn't have to be an expensive plan. Doesn't have to be a time consuming plan. Doesn't have to be an energy, energy draining plan. It just has to be a plan that you're willing to go and do something. Don't let, now, right now, the devil's probably lying to you, okay? He's probably saying to you, you don't have enough resources. You're too young. You're too old. You're not cool enough for a kid. You're not, they're not, they're going to think you're weird. Don't listen to those lies. All it takes is somebody that's willing to care and willing to to point other people to Jesus and point people to the Heavenly Father. It's not about you. It's about you being used by God to go and reach this fatherless generation. It's not that complicated. It really is not. Oftentimes, we as churches, we try to, like, well, we're going to form a committee, okay? And we're going to meet for six months, and then we're going to end up not doing anything. That's what we do as a church sometimes. We're not talking about that. This is not a program that I'm pushing. I'm not pushing a program on you. I'm, pu- I'm helping you understand what's going on with the fatherless, and you would go and do something. It's very simple. I want to encourage you, go and do something. I would not be standing in front of you this morning if it wasn't for the people that did something for me. I really wouldn't. It was my grandparents helped pick up the pieces. When I was 10, when I was 10 months old, they came alongside my mom and helped her. In sixth grade, I, I moved in second grade with my grandparents. My mom moved into another house. I moved in second grade with my grandparents, lived with them from second grade on until I went to college at their house. My grandfather passed away when I was in sixth grade. I took it really hard. I loved him. I was, he, was, he was my best friend. 
He passed away then when I was in sixth grade. I was a mess for the longest time. It was, it was my grandma and I, 60-some-year-old lady and a 12-year-old boy living in a house together. Okay? Got a little awkward sometimes. I watched enough Young and the Restless and Bold and the Beautiful to last me a lifetime, okay? Okay, it was, it was a, little, a little crazy. I knew all the soap operas. I knew all the characters, and I, I was familiar with all of it. But also, she watched Chicago Bulls and, the, and Michael Jordan with me. So we had a good balance going. We understood stuff. But I needed some male influences to come into my life. And for sake of time, I'm not going to go into all those male influences, but I had a guy named Rob, a youth leader, volunteer. He worked a regular job, but he was a deacon in our church, a volunteer. He helped fix things in the church. He also had him and his wife had an open door policy at their house where you could come anytime. And they didn't announce it, but you just knew you could stop at Rob and Lori's house. And they had an unlimited supply of Doritos, Oreos, and Mountain Dew, okay? So, and most kids want to go to that house, you know what I mean? And they had a swimming pool, too. And it was pretty, pretty awesome to go there. Then a guy named Brian, he, he wanted to take me hunting. He was a hunter. He's one of those guys that would drive along the side of the highway and he'd see a deer on the side of the mountain. And he'd say, there's a deer there. And I'd say, it looks like a rock, okay? <laughs> and so Brian took me hunting with him. He got my hunter safety course. Got me the, uh, gave me the gun I needed to use. Got it sighted in. Gave me the clothing I needed to wear. Gave me all this stuff. Helped me figure out everything I needed to do to safely go hunting in Pennsylvania. And we, we got set up, and I went hunting with him. He took me with him, and I never got, and that was horrible, and I never got a deer. I was terrible at it, okay? Terrible at it. You know, we were up in the woods the one time, one Saturday, and we're looking down through this brush, through the mountain, and we saw a deer. Actually, Brian saw a deer, and I finally, I found, I finally saw the deer in my scope, and he says, shoot it, shoot it. And I went, bam, shot the gun. Scope nails me right in the nose, okay? I'm bleeding, I'm crying, you know? And the deer walks away laughing at me. It was a horrible situation. And then Brian goes and tells people at church, okay? So I'm like, this is terrible. You know what I remember more than that? I remember the fact that this guy was willing to take time to care and spend time with a fatherless teen and to give him some time for a manly activity. And then I had this couple named Jim and Deb, and I shared it on the video. They were willing to let me come to their house and work, work for them, but then also I became part of the family. They, right during the nighttime when I would work after school, they would say, hey, clock out and come over for dinner to our house. And I'd sit there with him and his wife and their daughter, and we'd have dinner together. And I became like part of the family. You know, you can do this for other people. You, you, if you, I just want to encourage you, think about what you're good at, what you like to do. If you like to have a hobby you like to do, take some kids with you. If, you like to, if you're good at working on your car or your computer or you're good at cooking or barbecuing or sewing or whatever it might be, Bring some kids along. Bring a single mom along. Do, or do something for them. Cook something for them. Sew something for them. Do what you can. Use it as a blessing to other people. Don't just let your hobbies and your gifts and talents and abilities die with you. Use them for somebody else. I want to encourage you. Look what it says as we close at the end of this passage here in verse 36. Look what Jesus said to this guy. He said, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. You know, somebody probably showed you compassion. And they were willing to, to, to help you and encourage you. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was one of your parents. You had great parents. That's awesome. I hope my kids can say the same thing about me and my wife. Maybe it was your grandparents. Maybe it was a mentor, a teacher, a coach, whatever it might be. But I want to encourage you. You're here for a reason today. Pay it forward. Do it for somebody else. It's not a complicated thing. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Go and do thou likewise. Let everybody please stand with your heads bowed.